Hello everyone, welcome back. This is the Breakout Defender track. I'm Swapnil Shinde and I'll be moderating this session for today. And please submit them in the Q&A tab just on the right hand side of this video. We will have around uh, five to 10 minutes in the end for the questions you have. So we have uh, Mr. Lucas Ferrara with us. Uh, he's an uh, he's an highly experienced information security professional with over 25 years in the field. His expertise spans various sectors, including corporate uh, corporations, startups, government, and international organizations. Mr. Lucas has worked in multiple uh, information security domains and currently pursuing his PhD in cryptographic protocols. He's also a project leader, chapter leader on two continents and committee, committee member at OWASP. He also led the team that was responsible for organize, uh, organizing three highly successful OWASP uh, Global AppSec Conference in Brazil. Brazil. Uh, he'll be giving a talk on CVE overload, scaling container uh, vulnerability scans. So, all right, take it away, Mr. Lucas. We are looking forward for your talk. Okay, yeah, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm going to share my slides. Uh, yeah, um, hello, everybody. I'm here to talk about uh, CVE overload and uh, an effort that we are making to scale uh, container vulnerability scans. Um, so as was mentioned a little bit about me, I am a long time OWASP member um, and volunteer. So yeah, there is a user page for me in the old OWASP uh, wiki. And I've been a chapter leader, project leader, and yeah, organized conferences in, uh, a lot of uh, different OWASP activities. And yeah, I have a bit of uh, an international experience in uh, many different countries. Um, but yeah, going directly to the topic for today, um, we are dealing with, with container, uh, scanning containers for, for uh, vulnerabilities can be um, challenging and there are, several uh, problems that most companies face um, when doing the, uh, this kind of scan. Um, the first one is we usually get a huge number of uh, CVEs being reported by the, by the scans. Um, and within that huge number of CVEs, we kind of have to filter for um, things that are unfixed, so that may be reported by the scan, but uh, a fix is not available yet, uh, especially if you're using an upstream distribution, maybe the distribution is not ready yet. Um, some CVEs are marked as disputed, so they are gonna be reported by the scan. Uh, and if they are disputed, most probably there is no, uh, there is no fix for them. So uh, there's something we need to uh, evaluate. Um, a lot of the uh, container images that are being used have very big base images. And if you have a lot of software, the chances that you, that you have a lot of vulnerabilities being reported by a scan are gonna increase. Um, and lots of teams are slow to upgrade. So when you scan, you're gonna find lots of uh, known vulnerabilities, known CVEs, because yeah, they, are, they, they didn't have time or uh, didn't put the effort to upgrade all their images. Um, another of the challenges is we need to define how we're going to consolidate this and report it to the teams that are responsible for building the, the container images. So one idea is report per image. Uh, so each image get a list of CVEs reported to the, the team. The team can go there and find uh, what needs to be fixed and, and do it. Another possibility is reporting per CV, which means for each CV you you can list all the images that have this that that CV uh, present that where it, that's kind of found that specific CV. Um, then um, assigning this may be a bit more challenging, even though sometimes for reporting it may be easier to use the the per CV, or you can do absolutely no consolidation at all and just uh, create specific events for each single finding of 
of the scanner. And then you're going to generate a ton of events uh, or tickets. And eventually, yeah, you that, that contributes to the overload the, of uh, both the security and of the development teams that need to, uh, to fix those things. So uh, those choices are not always easy or obvious, and, but they are some of the challenges uh, we, we face. Um, uh, another challenge is how do we deal with uh, the CVs at the present in the base images? So most um, container images are based on something that's already existing. So you have a base image, which should be kind of a, a blank or a basic kind of container image. And teams are going to build on top of that and put their own uh, software and stuff on top of the base image. Um, and it means that most development teams don't really know or um, control what is within the base image. And uh, that also can be a challenge if we just report whatever is coming from the scanner. If a certain um, issue or certain vulnerability is in the base image, uh, who should get that alert? Um, in defining who is responsible for what in those boundaries, that that's uh, that that can be challenging, and it's something that we need to um, to prepare and think about. Um, so all those uh, challenges here, if we combine this with a big number of images and containers that are usually running in enterprises today, so the con uh, enterprises today are. Um, deploying more and more images and containers, and and this will become uh, um, a challenge in terms of uh, scale. And it it uh, can generate an overload in terms of uh, events or tickets that are being sent to uh, remediation teams. So the the teams are getting too many events, too many tickets, and they have trouble dealing with that. Um, so. Uh, continuing in, on top of the challenges. Um, so how can the, um, an, another challenge is how do we prioritize the remediation? Uh, and we define the priority so that the remediation teams are aware of the, the priority they need to assign to, um, <clears throat> uh, to a, a certain event or a certain ticket. Most common is uh, using the, the CVSS scoring system, the, the common vulnerability scoring system. This comes directly from the, the CVE database. There's a number there, you can just use it. Um, but if you are consolidating CVEs into one single event or a single ticket, then how do you use multiple CVSS scores into getting one single score for that specific image. And yeah, you can use the highest one or an average or define any other formula that works for your company. But yeah, that's some, also something that we need to work on and we need to um, uh, find a way to um, to work and adjust it in a way that works for, for each um, company and, and environment. Um, and also the prioritization of fixes that are in, in the base image in the packages that are added later, as, as I mentioned a little bit. Um, so um, how did we do it uh, before we started this, this review work to try to improve the state we were? So we're, we were generating a single ticket per instance, which means um, each instance of an image um, that's running somewhere in a, in a Kubernetes cluster, and that is the way we um, we used to uh, consolidate uh, all the events, all the CVEs for that specific instance. So that may generate duplicates because, or very similar tickets, because if we have the same Im image running in two different clusters, this is considered two instances, and we're going to get basically the same results, but they are for um, uh, that, that are for the same image, but which is running in different locations. Um, just using CVSS gives us a huge number of highs and criticals. Uh, that's uh, 
stressful and generates a bit of a stress in the communication with remediation teams. If we tell them, well, <clears throat> there is a note say that if everything is high priority, then nothing is high priority, right? So um, if we just send them things or most of the things we're sending are uh, considered very high or critical, in terms of priority, there, it's not helping them prioritize the, the fixes. Um, so we generated problems in getting the fixes within the, the SLAs we had defined. Um, and on top of that, we also had challenges in terms of uh, compliance requirements. So uh, first one is, is very US uh, specific. It's called uh, FedRAMP. Uh, that's a uh, uh, compliance scheme for uh, the uh, US federal government, but they have very explicit uh, scan requirements for containers that we need to follow. Um, and we it, this makes very hard to change the way um, we are working and because we cannot deviate from the um, the predefined way the, the compliance um, requirements are telling us that um, that we need to do. Uh, PCI has some scanning requirements um, and uh, companies have other contractual requirements in terms of um, uh, security that may involve containers and may um, be also need to be added to the, the huge list of um, compliance requirements that we need to fit within the the whole container scan program um, that that uh, we need to build. So just in a nutshell, what we're talking about in terms of uh, scale. Um, so yeah, uh, in, around July, uh, we used to have five uh, Kubernetes clusters. Um, we have two hundred. Uh, our developers are split in two hundred different teams. Um, which is quite a lot and uh, teams take responsibilities for the containers. So the huge number of teams makes it difficult for us to find out um, who's gonna be responsible for what. Um, so the containers in Kubernetes were organized by namespaces. We had around uh, 1400 uh, namespaces, um, uh, more than 2000 unique images. And here I'm talking about one single image file um, that stored somewhere. Um, of those images, um, most of them had CVEs. Very few images have had absolutely zero or no CVEs. Um, and in terms of instances in, in running containers, uh, it was um, about uh, 34,000 containers. So it's uh, quite a huge number if we split this into the, the 200 teams is still uh, quite a huge number of containers um, in the hundreds for each team. So it's kind of, uh, yeah, we can see that the, the, um, the numbers can pile up pretty quickly um, in, in such an environment. And yeah, it's not stopping. This is uh, still growing and people or teams are still developing containers and deploying more containers. So yeah, we, we don't expect this to stabilize. Uh, the expectation is this will continue growing. So given this context of what were the challenges we, we were seeing um, and the size of the environment uh, and the way the, the teams are organized. So what were the strategies that we thought about that we should implement in terms of um, improving the, the situation? So just to recall, the situation is we have a ton of containers. Um, we have a ton of CVEs that are being found in those containers. And we're generating a lot of uh, tickets to the remediation teams. And on top of that, by using CVSS, we are generating most of the uh, tickets that are generated are uh, high priority or above. So teams are getting maybe hundreds of tickets, uh, high priority tickets, and yeah, it doesn't help them prioritize. And 
we got uh, a lot of complaints from the uh, teams, development teams responsible for the containers that um, the whole system was not really uh, helping them uh, much. So, um, what did the so here the, a few of the strategies we thought that we could use to uh, improve that situation. So the the first strategy was let's make sure we have better risk assessment in or uh, as a consequence of better prioritization of tickets. So if we generate everything as top priority, then we're just saying that everything is the same priority. We need to make sure that we really prioritize those things that are more important um, and give teams a little bit more time to fix uh, the, the um, uh, vulnerabilities that are not uh, as important. So it's not about abandoning and not fixing stuff, but yeah, the it's about how much pressure and how much time we're going to be giving to the teams to uh, fix fix their stuff. Um, so the first thing was, well, let's leverage uh, industry standard data sets. Um, we're dealing with CVEs. Uh, that's a very well-known way of categorizing vulnerabilities. And there are some data sets that are built on top of the CVE database. So yeah, obviously we have CVSS and CVSS needs to be used. CVSS is a requirement from compliance and, and we cannot just abandon it. Um, CVSS is not perfect, but yeah, it's also one of the best ways to, we have to standardize the measurement of um, the impact that certain vulnerabilities can have. Um, EPSS, we, which is uh, the um, Exploitability Probability Scoring System created by first.org. Um, in EP, uh, EPSS tries to provide the number, which is what is the probability that a certain vulnerability um, can be exploited in the wild. So, or, uh, and, and that probability can help us in the priority because if something is very likely to be exploited, then we probably should fix it faster uh, than something that is very hard to exploit and has a very low probability of, of exploitation. So this data set will also, uh, will allow us to, to better understand what should be the priority of a, of a, a certain vulnerability. And another important uh, data set is uh, the KEV, which is the non-exploited vulnerabilities provided by uh, the uh, US government's uh, CISA. And basically that's a list of CVEs that are known to have been used in the wild in some kind of attack or exploit. Um, so the KEV gives us that picture of, okay, what is really being used? It's not about the probability anymore. It's about, yes, this was seen in the wild in an attack and and um, you should be careful with this specific vulnerability because yeah, attackers are using it. So um, then comes the question, how can we combine those uh, data sets? And the obvious strategy is let's use CVSS and EPSS, which provides cores and calculate uh, uh, priority. And that priority will be a combination of the impact and the probability. So we're gonna see a bit more in detail how, how we uh, are doing this um, in, in a few minutes. Um, the um, other thing that we need to combine the KEV, the non-exploited vulnerabilities. So the idea is uh, to increase the priority for um, CVEs that have an exploit in, in the wild, uh, which means, okay, if that's seen in the wild in an actual attack, let's put this at top priority because we uh, that, that's there is a, a a significant and real risk that it can be exploited. Um, and then, yeah, we had to refine some of the SLAs to meet compliance requirements. 
so is something we need to be sure that our SLAs are adequate to our case. And uh, especially if we have compliance requirements that, that we are going to be able to uh, meet our requirements, right? So yeah, this here is just an image of um, if we plot the, the CVEs in terms of the CVSS and the EPSS scores, uh, we get this kind of, uh, of distribution. So basically the image uh, in, on, on the left is saying, okay, um, we have a lot of large volume. Um, uh, we have a large volume of high severity vulnerabilities as per the CVSS, but uh, not a lot of those have a high probability of being exploited. So this is uh, where we put that uh, blue line saying, okay, whatever is on, on the top right of this uh, plot, well, has a high probability of exploitation and a, uh, a high impact. So that's what we need to prioritize. Things that have low um, uh, exploitability, low probability of exploitation in a low impact, then we can deprioritize them. Uh, and on the right, it's just um, uh, the graphical representation of how we are calculating our um, uh, uh, probability or priorities for our tickets. So basically, uh, we we define kind of thresholds at uh, uh, seven for the CVSS and half for the EPSS, um, and define those quadrants and everything that fits within one of those quadrants. We're go we're just gonna get a certain uh, priority. So the the uh, as it was uh, shown in 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 the left um, diagram. Uh, the the top right quadrant is the high priority. The the bottom left cor, uh, quadrant is the one where we're gonna have um, low priority. So yeah, that's just one of the ways to combine those two uh, numbers. Let's say um, and get one priority out of um, the 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 numbers that we get. So. This is the the scheme that we define in terms of uh, how we want to def uh, define our priorities. So another improvement strategy was streamline triage and remediation. So yeah, automate, reduce manual work, um, um, and, and provide uh, suggestions to the remediation team so that they can easily go there and, and fix their stuff. Uh, provide guidance, make sure that they know what uh, what to do, um, start doing SLA reviews. So are they meeting the SLAs? If, if they're not being able to meet the SLAs, what's going on? What kind of help they need? Um, and uh, one thing we, we define is that, well, if the CV has no fix for that moment, then we're gonna ignore it. So obviously if there is a fix that will be provided, uh, that is provided, Later in the future, we're going to be adding it in, in, into the mix. But um, yeah, we will not pass down to the developers something that has no fix. So we're not going to ask them to fix something that uh, the upstream provider did not provide a, a, a fix for. Um, yeah, so automating, making workflows uh, more efficient. Um, so we need to automate as much as we can because uh, teams are small and the number of containers is is huge. Um, so yeah, automated scanning, try to uh, do triage in assignment automatically as much as possible. Um, we manage to do this for most of our uh, tickets that come. So as as long as we we can, uh, we know who is responsible for. Uh, each uh, container or namespace, then we can automatically assign to the, the team responsible for it. Um, try to automate remediation as much as possible. So yeah, um, uh, th this also, we, we did it in a way that gives them flexibility. So the tools are gonna provide them um, uh, suggested pull requests that can be 
either automatically merged or may go through manual review. And that depends on uh, uh, each team's preference. So uh, that, that's where we, we are able to give teams a little bit of uh, flexibility into how they want to be working on, on remediation. And then uh, what we call validation, which is, yeah, once it's fixed, how do we check that it's really fixed? Um, so we need to do to automate it so that we can do it quickly. Um, and uh, one of the things is, is um, get to the point where you have a no touch uh, ticket closure. So once you have a ticket and you have fixed that container, the system by itself is going to know and it's going to close that ticket and no developer needs to go into the ticketing system and start clicking buttons somewhere so that uh, a, a certain uh, ticket is, is um, closed. So this requires some coordination between the data coming from the scanners into the um, in the ticketing system so that when we detect that something uh, that was present is not anymore, then we can go, uh, that there is an automation that goes to the ticketing system and kind of just close the ticket. This is not relevant anymore, this has been fixed. So let's focus on what's relevant and not, so the process should not get in, in the way of, of the work. So let's automate and, and uh, take tickets out of the way of the teams as much as we can and as quickly as we can. Um, so we um, also work on uh, improving um, workflows. And uh, that means that we um, remove the necessary steps. So sometimes our workflows, they have some steps that don't really add value. So we had a couple of steps in terms that, that were basically had the, the only purpose was to kind of provide acknowledgements. Oh yeah, I, I've seen this ticket, I'm, I'm working on it. And yeah, uh, for a lot of, of teams or for most of the teams, this was just adding to the toil or the need to enter a different uh, system, go to the ticketing system, go there and start clicking a button that was generating no useful work. So those kinds of, of unnecessary steps, we, we should uh, get feedback from the teams, um, review our workflows and, and make sure we are we're not keeping those, that we remove those steps from our workflows. Um, we, we, given the volume, we cannot um, spare or spend time on uh, activities that are not generating value. And, and that's the main um, the main goal that we need to have when we are improving uh, workflows. The other thing is sometimes uh, things are not uh, are named in a way that's not obvious to the from the perspective of the remediation teams. Um, and, and that sometimes happens that, uh, security teams have their own way of talking about things and um, uh, the development teams have kind of a diff slightly different language. And yeah, we should make sure that we are naming stuff from the perspective of the, the development teams and remediation teams so that they can quickly and easily understand what's going on in, in the workflow. So that's something, that's a, some of the work that we need to do together with them to make sure that everything is easily and quickly understand, understandable by uh, any developer that will be uh, pulled into the, the process into fixing uh, container vulnerabilities. So yeah, uh, continuing improvement strategies, uh, data-driven insights. So make sure we have data to understand what's going on. Um, collect, collect the data so that we can understand, manage, and improve the processes. Um, and one uh, thing that we need to pay attention in here is that we may have different data points or uh, different views that are important, that, that can be provided and are important to different uh, stakeholders. So this is one of the big challenges we uh, we had um, in, in our uh, program is that the many stakeholders, they want different kind 
not exactly different uh, data, but different views, different ways of viewing the, the data. So uh, ex uh, one example is um, uh, in, in the, the next bullet point. So the remediation teams, they basically, the data points they need is what should be a priority. That, that's the main thing for them. What, what is the work that I need to do and how should I prioritize it? Um, the management needs status updates. So they need a kind of more general view. Okay, how, how many uh, tickets are coming? How good are we at fixing those? Um, how can we, can we improve? Um, and um, the, the uh, security teams, the people doing the, the triage, for example, they, they are interested in SLAs and they need, need to, to keep an eye for uh, the SLAs and understand um, how they're going, they're doing, how the program is, is going. Um, another uh, kind of different viewpoint is the viewpoint for uh, compliance teams because they need to do compliance reports uh, and depending on the um, compliance standards we're talking about, they may have very specific ways of reporting. So they may need uh, another um, kind of view. So one of the challenges we had is that when we started moving the, the program and making sure all the tickets were aligned with our remediation teams, we started losing some of the information that was important for for uh, the compliance teams to report. Uh, so uh, the the quick example is a remediation team, as uh, uh, as it's obvious, they want to know okay, what is the list of things I need to fix and what's the priority. Uh, and basically, um, many of our remediation teams they care about the um, what is the image I need to go there and, and change. Uh, I, I need to go to the code and change something. What is that uh, image that I need to go there where, where that, that specification or that, that Docker file that I need to go there and, and fix? Um, that's what they care about. Um, on the other hand, our compliance team had to report, make reports based on CVEs. So it's a completely different way of seeing what is basically the same data. So the data is about we we should have uh, uh, the data about which image has uh, has been which CV has been found in, in what image, um, but but yeah. So the the way we start representing this and 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 showing this uh, will be different for different stakeholders. So we need to be able to get in, in a data driven approach where given the data, let's make the different views available to, to the different stakeholders. Um, and, and yeah, that may require uh, some, some preparation in, in uh, uh, quite a lot of work from security teams so that we can have all the different views. We make sure that the, the data is available in a way that can be viewed uh, uh, to meet the requirements of each of those um, stakeholders. So, the idea that uh, we had is that we need to have a central data repository. So we had multiple systems. So you can imagine we'll have uh, a, a system that's scanning the containers. You have a ticketing system that's a separate thing. Um, you have uh, systems in the middle to uh, calculate priorities. Um, and all those things started being kind of distributed and each one uh, had different portions of the data we needed. So the the idea was, okay, let's put everything together. Let's create uh, what initially we, we were calling a, a big database where we put everything inside and then we can have multiple views into that uh, database in a way that's useful to each of the stakeholders. Okay, um, so uh, a few few things we we did actually uh, implement. So we first automating as much as possible. Uh, we improved the inventory, so we were able to find who's responsible for what. That was uh, a huge work that was done um, because if the inventory is not good, it, the, to start with, you you don't know um, who to call in to fix um, when you find certain vulnerabilities. 
Um, with that, we could have auto assignments. Um, we um, uh, define strategies to uh, handle irrelevant CV or what we call irrelevant CVs. Those are that are disputed. So how do we handle those? How do we, um, uh, we need to do some risk analysis on it. And those that have no upstream fix, um, and we need to review those things from time to time because that situation may change. Um, automatic validation and closure. So after the work is done, I talk a little bit about that. Just go there, fix everything. So this was implemented. We gained a lot of time. We gained a lot of time from the uh, triage team so that uh, the, the team could focus on uh, more important things that could not be easily automated. And yeah, automate data collection. That's also important. Collect all the data, make sure you have the metrics, make sure you have uh, all the different views into the data. Um, yeah, um, so a second step we, we took was we need to provide better base images. So we need all teams to be using the same set of base uh, images. They need to be up to date. Um, and we started working to go into uh, the so-called distroless images which is basically an image that is more compact, has less software inside, so we redu reduce the uh, attack surface. Um, then after that, next step was let's work on the prioritization. So once we have things automated and the, the process is, um, is running faster by itself, then okay, now let's tackle the prioritization. So we um, got the prioritization based on CVSS and EPSS as, uh, as shown in those uh, uh, diagrams. We implemented it, uh, we integrated it with um, the whole system. Uh, and once we get the scan results, that uh, prioritization algorithm or formula is gonna run and before and, and give us a priority before we pass it on into the ticketing system to the remediation teams. So uh, this now uh, allows us to, to have better prioritization for all, all those tickets, which um, will make it easier for uh, remediation teams. So um, a little bit of what we got so far. So th those are uh, just uh, quick numbers. Uh, and what I really wanna show here in, in this uh, graph is if you look at the, the months of June and July, um, not only about the volume, but the number of uh, tickets that were classified as uh, critical. And uh, in, in that was a huge number. In, in uh, beginning of August, mid-August, we, we implemented the new prioritization formula. And now we can see that we have much less uh, high priority uh, tickets. Um, and a lot of moderate, which, uh, well, is expected. The big issue that still remains is, oh yeah, we still have a huge number of, of um, um, tickets and that is uh, still a problem. So that's the, what we need to tackle now is, okay, how are we gonna reduce the, the, the uh, overall number of, of tickets um, now that we, kind of, it seems that we got the priority uh, priority problem under control. Uh, but but yeah, so that, that that is a big shift in really using the combination of EPSS, CVSS and uh, KEV is giving us uh, very good results in terms of um, having uh, what we consider is the right priority for um, each CV or each um, uh, ticket and container that needs to be fixed. We still have uh, a few challenges and a few things we need uh, to improve. So yes, as I mentioned, still a huge number of tickets. Um, we we need to find better ways uh, to re reduce the number of tickets, reduce the 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 amount of work that needs to be done. Um, so uh, SLA management, we need to keep doing uh, and improving it. Um, even though uh, tickets have less priority, they will have uh, longer uh, SLA time. Still need to make sure we fix them in, uh, in, in the right amount of time. Um, so we still need, need to refine the policies on how we'll be dealing with 
the CVs that have a low fix or that are marked as disputed in the uh, NVD database. That's um, the we're, we're doing it, but I think we need to have a better risk-based approach um, for uh, how we, we deal with those uh, CVs. We need to get a shift left approach and improving the tooling and everything uh, that is available to developers so that we uh, end up fixing the problems earlier. That's basically the concept of shift left, right? Um, yeah, uh, we don't have the central data repository that they described. So we're collect still collecting data from multiple sources to build our uh, data dashboards. Um, and yeah, it makes a bit more complicated. Um, and there are a few data points that uh, we still cannot easily calculate. Um, yeah, and the other thing is um, we, we will need to define um, better criteria for the upstream providers, uh, which means the entities that are providing uh, images that are, are being run in our infrastructure. So basically is refining the criteria of what's acceptable, uh, what's not, and how we're going to handle the um, a provider that's that's not provide not providing timely fixes. Um, so that's the big issue that we have in terms of upstream providers. So we have our internal base images, but um, some teams also use uh, external images that come directly from from a, a software provider or an open source project. And we we need better criteria for allowing those images to come in. So, yeah, uh, to finish the few lessons we learned. So CVSS is not the end of the story. We can make better priorities. Um, so we, we this for us is clear. We managed to reduce the number of uh, critical and highs. Uh, this reduces the pressure on developing teams, but it's also, uh, uh, I must also compliment that just better prioritization is also not the end of the story. We also need to uh, to go beyond that. A good inventory is critical. So yeah, you can't automate, you can't really um, uh, as properly assign things if you don't know who is responsible for what. Automation, so automation will reduce toil and that's the only way you can, you can scale. So uh, uh, when, when you start automating, you start seeing that uh, you, you, you are able to handle more, um, more issues in less time. Um, so we need to make sure that the devs have access to the tools that they need to, to uh, understand and, and fix the, the issues. So yeah, uh, up-to-date base images, distro as how to use it or not training, documentation, all this is important so that uh, the teams know what to do. And yeah, uh, data is essential. So we need to have the data not only to manage the program, but to provide the data to the stakeholders that uh, have um, interest or uh, any dependency on the, uh, the, the program. Uh, okay, so this is uh, the end of the presentation. Here are links to my uh, social networks. If anyone uh, wants to uh, to get in touch, and yeah, I think we have time for a few questions. Awesome! Thank you so much, Mr. Lucas, uh, for that amazing presentation. Uh, now moving on to the questions. The first question we have from Bobby Lin. What is your methodology for fixing CVs related to framework or tool level like Python or Node.js? Do you have, uh, uh, do you give longer SLA in this situation? It seems like the change impact will be high as you need to upgrade the whole framework or tool version. Yes, um, unfortunately, um, our compliance requirements do not allow us to give more time. Um, so be, because of that, we the, our compliance requirements are very strict in terms of um, container SLAs. Uh, this was also one of the big drivers into perfecting the priority calculation. So getting a priority calculation that's more risk-based and that can uh, understand the, uh, not only our environment, but uh, the whole vulnerability and the exploitability a little bit better. 
because once we apply whatever formula we have uh, in our formula had to be uh, accepted by our um, compliance uh, supervisory uh, organizations in terms of of uh, FedRAMP, for example. Um, we have certain organizations that we we are in, in constant conversation and they need to agree with with the uh, changes we are making to our program. Um, so once we apply the formula, we don't have uh, flexibility for um, adjusting, oh, because this is a framework, because this is uh, uh, a compiler, language interpreter, or, or, or whatever it is. So uh, yes, those are disruptive. And I think what we need to do is, is um, make sure that we can keep up to date with the um, with the changes. So one uh, recommendation that we, we try to push um, and work together with our product security team is um, don't keep using the the um, the you know when when uh, you have um, a change from uh, Python through two to Python three. Uh, well, there is a, uh, an amount of time where Python 2 is still maintained that you could just keep using it and, and uh, have all the CVEs being fixed and everything, uh, but pushing into changing to the next uh, version or the next level, which uh, for in this example would be going to Python 3, um, will allow you to continue this much longer. So it comes to a point where you're gonna to have to do the switch. So do, do it early, so do you have more time for, for testing? And, and that's the big uh, push we uh, we try. But um, yeah, we don't have a, a special uh, strategy in, in this case. Um, usually one thing that happens for, for uh, at least in our environment for containers, uh, uh, frameworks and uh, interpreters like like uh, Python or any other will be part of the base image. So um, we can work directly with the, the team that's providing the base images to make sure that they will be providing the, the right tools at the right level. And uh, one th this has one big advantage is if you have most of your teams using the same base image, once you fix that one, that's a fix that goes for everybody. So uh, that's a way to to generate scale uh, in, in a sense. So those are a bit of the, the strategies that we, we uh, try to use uh, in that kind of case. Um, yeah, I, I hope I gave you, I answered the question and provide some insight. Awesome. So now moving to the next question, uh, is CVSS the adequate measure of criticality for container vulnerabilities? Um, maybe not. Uh, in our case, again, that's not an option. So CVSS must be included in the um, in, in the calculation we, we need because uh, of our requirements. Um, I think CVSS provides uh, an interesting indication of impact. Uh, and the combination of CVSS and EPSS then provides us with with uh, much better data points. So yeah, um, in some sense, uh, uh, CVSS is probably what we have today as the best for calculating the um, uh, in, impact or our standardized calculation for impact for um, for vulnerabilities. Uh, so I would say CVSS today is the best we have. Um, I haven't found any other um, kind of data database or or data points that, that would provide better uh, information in that sense. So we we should complement CVSS, but we can't just abandon it. All right. Uh, another question we have is, are there any shift left strategies that uh, can be used to improve container security? Um, yes, you have uh, a lot of. Um, first one is providing timely information to the developers. Um, one thing that we did, it's a little bit of the shift left, is providing um, automated pull requests. 
um, for the upgrades that need to happen. So that shifts a little bit from after the fact that I already have my container to, okay, I have the, the pull request, I can just work with it. Um, we got to the point that some teams are fully automated. So they, they get this, the, the tool provides a pull request that's automatically approved and merged. Um, some teams need to um, uh, do a manual review. Uh, this is one of the strategies. Um, uh, other strategies will be around uh, providing them uh, information. So there are a few uh, things that we can do in, in terms of ingestion controls. When we are uploading an image to a, um, a registry, a repository of some kind, we can start checking there as well. So uh, don't wait until the image is being used for, for uh, doing a check. When people are kind of uploading it to the, the registry, so even before it's used anywhere, start the checks. So this gives the developers um, information earlier in the whole chain. Um, so yeah, that, that I think are the, those are the main strategies um, we have kind of explored. There, there could be other kinds of tools that provide information to, to uh, developers a bit earlier, but um, yeah, uh, they are, I think, harder to implement. Th those are not very difficult to implement strategies. Um, technically not difficult, uh, I must say, uh, in terms of process and, and talking to um, or convincing developers and making sure that, that everything is in place and all the activities are properly executed. Yeah, it's a bit more challenging. But yeah, you know, putting an ingestion control in, into your um, container registry is not that technically challenging. Uh, it's the same scan that you do after the fact, you just do it now. So you just choose um, exact uh, the, the moment that the scan or execute the scans in, at multiple moments. So, and, and it, that, that's why I, I think it's not that technically challenging. Uh, getting acceptance for that, that may be a different challenge. So the, the organizational and, uh, and process challenges are, are the big challenges in, in that case. Awesome. So we have a last question from Andres. Uh, do you, consider any environmental aspects that is uh, deployment in container hardening uh, that uh, prevents specific actions to calculate the priority of a vulnerability? Yeah, so we didn't implement it yet. Uh, one thing we um, are thinking about implementing is uh, adjusting the priority the, uh, depending on environmental factors. One of the environmental factors that we uh, already have the data, so we just need to integrate this data into the, the system uh, is that we know which containers are uh, accessible from the internet in some form. So, uh, so if you have a container that's uh, purely internal to your uh, Kubernetes cluster, has no communication to the outside world, uh, you could put it as a, as a lower priority than a container that has uh, interactions with the outside world. Um, so if you manage to collect this information, that's uh, something that can can and, and probably should be used in, in terms of the, um, defining the priorities. Um, it's uh, something we are exploring to um, uh, implement similar to the, the non-exploited vulnerabilities. So uh, if we get a certain container um, in, that we are working on the priority and that container is accessible from, from the external uh, world, let's say, outside of the, the cluster, then that container um, will get a higher, pro a higher priority for that. So that, that's one of the, there may be other environmental uh, factors, um, but this is the one we have identified as, as uh, possible to, uh, to implement and that, that's something we already have most of the data we need. Amazing. Uh, so all right, thank you so much, Mr. Lucas, uh, for the talk.
and uh, the answers. I hope uh, that answers all your questions. Uh, if you have, if you still have any questions to Mr. Lucas, feel free to reach out to him via Hua. On that note, thank you so much everyone for joining and thank you so much, Mr. Lucas. We hope you all have a great day ahead. Thank you.